we record this for those people who have told me they couldn't be with us tonight and start in the same way we do every Wednesday night with the most theme song. I've been to Romamu, I've been to BJ, I've searched all over for a place to pray. I found the mosh pit and knew that this was it. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray, actually white. Come on, everybody, sing along with me. I found community that is in tune with me, singing and dancing in a Zoom God. Some contemplation mixed with elation. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And I'm turning gray. A chance to meet you, a chance to greet you, a time to deepen what it means to belong. Uh, let's have some fun tonight and spread some joy and light. I am a Moshnik and I'm here to stay. And we're turning gray. Hey, here's the Hoff Memorial harmonica solo. I don't know if Hoff was a baseball fan. But he loved life, so how could he not love baseball? All right, that's enough of that. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I see that uh, Aaron's joined us. Jay has joined us with what's the uh, <laughs> Shea Stadium in the background as your background. All right, Jay, you're going to find out that uh, uh, there's no bigger Mets fans than Wayne and Lisa. So welcome, everybody. Tonight's the annual Mosh Baseball Night. And um, for those people who will uh, arrive after this moment, uh, they're going to have to wait at the top of the aisle for the ushers to let them in, you know, until there's a break in play. So welcome to Wayne. Welcome to Lisa. They're coming to us from the <laughs> from the writer's strike heartland of uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, you can unmute yourselves, Wayne. And Lisa, uh, because you're going to be muted most of the time here. And uh, it's just just a joy to, the real reason I wanted you on is so that we (laughs) might have an excuse to get together. Yeah, it's great to see you, Mark. It really is. So, so, we we worked together since you and, uh, you know, since you guys got married. That's right. So, uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, There's Judy. I know you need to leave a little early. And that's not a curly W, but we'll let you stay anyway. Judy and I actually went to a game last week and we saw the Nats win, but nearly froze our Patinskis off. It was so damn cold. Really? Yeah. Um, what was I going to say uh, before I rudely interrupt? Oh, that. so when Renee and I were looking for a band to play at our wedding, um, I figured that all of my Jewish friends would play the Jewish, you know, the horrors and the Jewish folk dance, but my Jewish friends can't play pop music. And so I went looking for a band and I had a dear friend, um, Pam Bricker, just an amazing jazz vocalist, Mace, the memory be for a blessing, who told me you should go check out these guys, special delivery. So I wanted a band that um, was uh, equally as comfortable in a, a smoky bar as they were in um, uh, uh, you know, in, in tuxedos, <laughs> oh, you guys did look kind of funny in tuxedos. Yeah, um, it wasn't great. And, and they knocked my, our socks off. And so we hired them to play the pop music at our wedding. And then after that, and Wayne was in that band. And after that, I figured, you know, I'm going to work with these guys. <laughs> because it's easier to teach non-Jewish musicians Jewish music than it is to teach Jewish musicians pop music. Although yeah. Wayne is Jewish and there was another drummer, the drummer in the band. No, he wasn't Jewish. No, no not Jim, no. Were, I was the only, the only one. one. That's right. You were the only Jew in that band. That's mm. right. Uh, so, yeah. so, so that's how we met. We hired you and then we, uh, at, at, as Bo- Bogey would say, it was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. It certainly was. Yeah. Hey, Bina, welcome. Uh, there you go. What hat do you have on? That looks like a golf hat. 
<laughs> All right, you can stay nonetheless. That's okay. Um, so uh, I want to share my uh, a little bit with you to uh, to show Wayne in his happy place. Uh, this is a little while back, though. <laughs> Say the least. So uh, there's Wayne in his uh, Mets um, Mets hat at Shea, and uh, uh, tell me what your caption was for this that you told me, uh, Wayne. I thought it was pretty funny. I said there is no more New York picture of me than this. I'm doing the Sunday crossword puzzle as I'm in the New York Times crossword puzzle <laughs> as I'm waiting for the game to start. <laughs> <laughs> and so you see on the upper right. That's uh, that was the core of what later uh, the Mark Novak band, um, and that was right before a uh, concert that we did with the local uh, Chazan. And you see Wayne is the second from the right, and so maybe one or two of you met Steve. He's next to me, um, looking to to my well to my right, but to your left. Uh, and uh, Steve did the PA system. He brought the PA system for the retreat. Uh, some of you might have met Steve. Um, uh, I uh, nicknamed the band Mark and the Follically Challenged. Yes, true. <laughs> Jay, you would have fit right in. <laughs> Actually, we we did we did you a gig. Fine. We did a gig I with did meet Steve. Mark once, and it was uh, me and Jerry, who's on the all the way to the right of that yeah. picture, and Dave DePaulo, who's all the way to the left, and Steve, and we called ourselves the Glare. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Then there in the bottom, uh, the bottom right. Four tops. The four topless tops. That's uh, a picture that made it to uh, the Mark Novak, the now defunct Mark Novak Band website. But you see uh, Wayne sitting behind me playing keys while I'm in ex ecstasy, <laughs> singing something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> um, so continuing to the next slide here. Uh, that's not where I wanted to go. Now, so Lisa, uh, I uh, I met much later, um, but uh, when did you? When was your fortieth anniversary, you guys? Well, our fortieth actually is next year, uh -huh. but we've been together for forty years. Gotcha. Okay, so here's Lisa. Look at that computer. With uh, Paul Blair and Paul Blair <laughs> talking about the Orioles, uh, Shulamit, his great great center fielder, um, and Lisa um, was a sports writer. And this is meeting Paul Brer, surprising her, had her job after he read her Sports Illustrated story. And a bit we'll hear Lisa's story about her dad and how she became a, a sports writer um, and, and all of those good things. I just want to get through a couple of more pictures. Um, I found this picture online. Yeah. <laughs> Were you robbing the cradle? Yeah, <laughs> Look you look pretty young. 12. You do. You do. You still look that much younger than me, so it's fine. So now, Lisa, you have to tell us the story. It says, um, Lisa Winston, when a line drive hit by Miguel Montero doesn't kill you, it only makes you stronger or results in a flesh eating virus. Meet a longtime baseball writer with a whole bunch of stories to tell. So I, I didn't find the article, but w what's the story of the picture? And, and you got hit by a, fly, a, a ball in the stands? Yes, I was um, covering, I think it was the, Car I, I, I apologize if details wrong, it was the Carolina League All-Star Game. Um, and Frederick. it was actually being held, thank God, in Frederick that year. And we lived, you know, 25 minute drive from Frederick. And um, I would always, all the games I did, I would, you know, beforehand, especially for the home run derbies, generally stand on one of the sidelines by the dugout. Uh, usually felt pretty, pretty safe because they were trying to hit it out. So they'd either hit a home run or strike out or pop out. But I'm, I'm there. And I mean, I'm watching. I see what's going on. Miguel Montero uh, was... Up, taking back, BP. Taking BP. Well, no, it was a home, home run derby. Oh, home run derby. It was the home run derby. And he hit a, just a laser line drive down the right field line, you know, first base, first base line. And, I mean, I saw it coming, and I was actually wearing a dress, thank God, but, I mean, a long dress, so I was somewhat covered. I tried to jump. Um, I jumped up instead of, like, out of the way. And it just, I mean, it hit my shin, my left shin, and just sort of trickled into the dugout. And the, I mean, the, uh, the, the trainer immediately like came, looked at me and go, took one look at it and said, okay, you're, um, you live near here, right? I said, yeah, he goes, leave, get in your car and go home. Because in a half hour, you won't be able to. This is gonna, in about a half hour, you're not gonna be able to walk. And the funny thing is it was not broken. It was the ha -ha, funny part wasn't broken it hurt for a while but the the ball which was kind of probably dirty had been used a while 
made like the tiniest little boo-boo. Didn't even notice the boo-boo, just a little scratch. And I had my leg wrap for about a week, and when I took it off, it I was like, I don't think it's supposed to look like this. It's like black and awful. And again, I had a trainer who looked at it and said, okay, like in one move, he pulled, and this was in California, um, so I'm not like near, near home, and he pulls out his phone and he calls the team orthopedist and says, I'm sending someone over to you right now and you have to see her. And I was like, yeah, I mean, another day and you probably have lost your leg. Oh my gosh. Because it had become um, necrotic. A, a necrotic and oh, yeah. there's a name for it. It was like that. Uh, cellulitis. Cellulitis. First. Yes, necrotic. Yeah. But I, I don't even have a scar. But mm -hmm. I was I was toughing it out because, you know, there's no crime in baseball. <laughs> but there could have possibly been a loss there. Um, and I did, this is the only time I ever did this, I'd gotten the ball back, and the next time when I saw Miguel Montero, I actually asked him, to, I told him the story, and I got him to autograph it for me. So, um, awesome, awesome. Well, I, I do want to differ with you, though, Lisa, because there is crying in baseball, because yeah. my earliest baseball memory is weeping a little after Bill Mizorowski hit the home run, in 1960. Yeah, that was and, and, a new Yankee fan. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I grew up a Yankee fan. And what I want to do is I want to call on everybody here whose videos are on and ask you, what, who was your team now that it was established that the Mets were and still are Wayne and Lisa's team? Who, no, not, not Lisa. my team, never, by the way. Oh, it's never your team? Know. Oh, I didn't so like them. I did. I somebody didn't like them. I. She's a reporter. She. I'm a reporter. I. I like players, certain players, but I do not have a favorite team. Not even now. Expos. Even now. I did. Oh, I loved the Expos. That's true. I love the Expos. Uh, you know, if they sure. came back, I'd be an Expos fan. They so are the Mets. Yeah. yeah. So that's in the yeah. we call that Mechaye Me team. You know, when they come back to life. Well, right. Like, they, they did, you know, and they, they are the Nats. And the Nats won today, by the way, everybody. I think it was 11 to 6. So, see, miracles do happen. Um, they're actually playing quite well. So let's go around. Um, we now established that we got a Mets fan from for life in, in Wayne. We have a non-baseball fan, but a great player fan in Lisa because of the you're, – you're, you're a writer, and so you didn't take uh... – Couldn't have favorites. Yeah, you didn't play favorites. So I'll call on you. Tell us who was your team as a kid and who is your team now, even if they're the same. So then I'll start. As a kid, the, the Yankees were my team. And now I'm a Nats fan. And I never just want to say that I never was an Oriole fan, even when Washington did not have a team. Okay, let's go around. Ellen Weaver, unmute yourself. We can guess. Uh, Ellen, I'm unmuting you. I can't. You can't. You, you, oh, there you go. Go ahead. Thank you. I got you. Why can't I hear you? You're unmuted. Oh, it's not working on your computer. You've got to get on the phone. Okay, let's go on. Hannah, you were a I, I, know, I know who you were, uh, who was your team as a kid. Uh, well, I was raised in Glendale, California. So I was a Dodgers and an Angels fan. And I still sort of had both. And I attended an Angels Nats game 10, 15 years ago, and the Angels won. <laughs> Great. Uh, 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 Ellen, you can put it in the chat, you know. If, uh, Jay. I don't know how, if you can guess. <laughs> <laughs> For the whole life. Um, Pretty much, although, you know, when I was in uh, San Francisco and they, they just built that beautiful new stadium that I could walk to um, and then met Willie Mays in the airport lounge, uh, San Francisco, but I saw him play for the Mets at a, you know, Dwight double header when he was still playing, you know, still playing. So it, it's Mets, you know, I just like a good game now. Um, I like the Oryx Blue Wave I liked. <laughs> You know, if we have to keep it in this country, I mean, I, mean, I lived in Tokyo, you know, so the, the Yomiri Giants were everybody's favorite there as well. So, yeah, so the, the, the I, I know it's got the Mets, Mets, he's Mets, Mets. There's this great little, I don't know if it's life-size statue of Casey Stengel in the third floor of the um, 
nice little portrait gallery. I don't know if you've ever seen it up there in the heroes. The ba oh, it's oh. it's 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 wonderful. Yeah, yeah Wayne. Next time it. you're in DC, we'll go. I have to. <laughs> Metsies, Metsies, Metsies. Thanks, Jay. Ellen, you're on. Okay, go ahead. Tell us. I'm still not hearing you. <laughs> Maybe your phone is muted. Oh, no, I can't hear you. Yeah, you, Would you work on your technical stuff, please? Get another uh, device. Maybe you need an iPad, too. <laughs> Wait, I'm getting a signal from Ellen. She's a Phillies fan. <laughs> yes, she <Now>. is. <laughs> but we don't know if she was a Phillies fan when she was a kid. That's true. Uh, okay. Bruce. And then, Bruce and then, um, uh, and then Gail. The Yankees, when we moved to the Dominican Republic, Los Verdes, which was a local team and then called Ciudad Trujillo, and now uh, the Cubs. Great, great. Gail, are you a baseball fan? Not so much. I have to say I like basketball the best, but um, but as a kid, my dad took me to Forbes Field in Pittsburgh mm -hmm. right before it was um, torn down, and then uh, Three River Stadium was built and now there's uh pnc park so which i love by the way. i hear it's a great place for a game oh, it is. Fantastic. yeah fantastic. bill rosenthal i could have guessed you would have been here tonight <laughs> so phil and then uh devora and bina bill who's your favorite team as a kid and who's your favorite team now so as a kid definitely the brooklyn dodgers the eternal underdog the champion of equity diversity and inclusion and it kind of set my career path as well. Uh, when they moved out, um, I was a bit heartbroken, uh, felt like a lot had been torn away, um, evolved to the New York Mets, um, who had a lot of former Dodgers, among others. And um, then when I moved down here, I did become a bit of an Orioles fan without, the day I came here, the Nats moved out a bad sign. And, um, and now I'm back to the Nats. Um, and again, the eternal underdog, but hopefully they will get back to where they should be. Great. Thanks for asking. You're, you're welcome. Ellen, do you have uh, audio yet? It's in the chat. No, okay. It's in the chat. <laughs> oh, it's in the chat. I, I didn't see it. Hold on. Let me take a look. Uh, uh where are you i don't see oh, well, as a kid the new york giants as an adult mets fan big time and now must be phillies fan of course <laughs> uh, who won the phillies game today by the way anyone who won extra innings i don't know okay devora and bina and then uh devora lynn well when i was a kid we lived about five minutes from forbes field and on a good night you could hear the game and the crowd and it was unbelievable i will never forget my first night game when you walk you know you walk down that whatever that is you know the the yeah. hallway or something and then there's the whole thing in front of you i'll never forget that it was so magical roberto clemente was my favorite player and i'm glad they named a bridge after him in pittsburgh and uh that's my story i don't really have a team right now because since the 70s the pirates have sucked so <laughs> Maybe, you know, maybe this is their year. I don't know. But we'll, so how about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this answer. All right. My answer? Yeah. Why? <laughs> so when I was a kid in Hebrew school, the gifts, the prizes that we could win were tickets to the baseball game. Mm -hmm. And so my first games were with the Montreal Expo, sitting out in the bleachers in the middle of, I don't think Olympic Stadium, no, Olympic Stadium had not been built. So it was just in Jerry Park. That was it, in Jerry. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, unfortunately for my father, I kept winning, so he had to keep taking me. Um, <laughs> now, um, I live near Toronto, so I've been to many Blue Jays games, but I don't really keep up because they play a lot of games. So. <laughs> Um, Devorah, I mean, Bina, do you want to sing a, a one line from the song? You'll never guess what happened today at the baseball game. That's enough. <laughs> Lioness caught flies by 
Holding his holding uh, his blanket his and catching a oh, beanie. Snoopy was the one who captured the ball in his teeth, right? Okay. Next time we'll we'll sing this song. Devorah Lynn. Yeah. So um uh my great uncle was in the minor leagues of the senators, but uh, the story, family story was he was too short to go to the majors. He became a dentist and he became the dentist for the senators. <laughs> so I went to, uh, uh, even though I was a girl and I had a lot of boy cousins, I went to a heck of a lot of games. And I even remember um, being allowed to skip school for some of them, I think. And um, unfortunately, he never took me to spring training. <laughs> I guess I had to go to school. And it was at Griffith Stadium on Georgia Avenue. And um, then they left town and it broke my heart. And um, I, we moved to Boston and we were in Back Bay and could uh, hear the game in Fenway Park. And I went to a few games there. But uh, I married a Jewish scientist, and it's like a mixed marriage because he doesn't like spectator sport, sports, or he, and he can't sing. He doesn't play. He played the accordion as a kid, and um, uh, so I haven't. I haven't been following um, the Nationals, and and I wish somebody would take me. <laughs> I really want to go go but back. Hint, hint, hint. I love it. I just love well, it. Well, somebody was saying we need a motion night at the at the. Yeah, park. that would be great. Shulamit, did you say say anything yet? Now you you muted yourself after you unmuted yourself. I have not said anything yet. Um, I'm still an Orioles fan. I resist being a Philadelphia fan, Ellen. Um, I don't think I have to just because I live here now. Um, and when my boys were little, the Orioles, if you were in a uh, little league, which they were, you could take your kids to the baseball park and go into the clubhouse and for a dollar each kid, you got a hot dog and a soda and a ticket to the bleachers. And we did that a bunch. It was really fun. Um, so I, I remain an Orioles fan. But I also have a short little Hank Aaron story. Well, why don't you hold on to that? We'll get to story time. Okay, good. I'll, I'm holding. Everyone will have cookies <laughs> and milk. Is that what's going to happen? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Hey, Rabbi Mark, you skip me. Who did I skip? Judy. No, I'm sorry, Judy. My dad is a was was a blessed memory a, a native Washingtonian. He sold programs at Griffith Stadium that Devorah mentioned and uh, was a lifelong Senators fan. So when they left the second time in 71, I was six years old. I never did see them play uh, at RFK. We just didn't have baseball. Baseball was not a thing in my house growing up because my dad being almost 50 years old was not gonna switch teams to the Orioles. So it sounds like your story too, Devorah. Um, but when the Nats came to town in 2005, my son was seven years old and it was a perfect time. Sadly, my dad had passed on already, but um, my son and I bonded over Nationals baseball and I'm wearing my uh, my World Series t-shirt. <laughs> so what I can tell you is that um, baseball was an important part of Wayne and Lisa's house. And I want to share with you a video that they sent with me of their daughter, Dina, at three years old, singing. Oh, hey, what happened? Don't tell me that. There we go. Okay. Come on. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's the camera. Hold on a second. I got to fix that. Yeah. It's not coming through. She um, sings much better than that now. Yeah. She's a little better now. A little better. Maybe because it's uh, not good. How old is she now? She's 32. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Dana, face the camera. Stage <laughs> 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 
You know, it's funny. You have to understand something. I'm a musician, as you know, and uh, Dana has, you know, spent her whole life being in bands and, and went to Berkeley College of Music and really can sing. We knew you in Back Bay. Oh, boy, we, back could hear, then. we could hear Fenway from the window. Yeah, that's right. And, I hate uh, to admit, all I could understand was East Side, West Side. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't read her. her... You didn't like Signals. her sign language. <laughs> the old oh. Mets theme song. <laughs> That's great. Did, right. Does Dana know that you were showing this tonight? No. Okay, good. We won't and tell we that. we won't tell? That's right, Mark. Right? <laughs> That's it's a hush hush. So now that we're into singing songs, why don't we share a couple of songs, uh, Wayne? Uh, okay. And uh, why don't you start with, uh, with Take Me Out in English. I'll sing Take Me Out in Yiddish. And then you can share the David Frischberg song that you turned that's really about the Brooklyn Dodgers, which Hannah, you went and listened to today. Um, but uh, but you 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 use that music and you put it well, to I think it's my own song. I oh, just use inspiration. Dogs. Of course. I, I changed it. I mean, no, the song that I wrote is 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 my song. It's it just happens. Oh, it's just inspired by oh inspired by Dodgers. Well, New York Yankee Bernie. <laughs> Actually I got to play with Bernie Williams, which is fun. Music, uh, not baseball. I got to play music with him, not baseball. No He's kidding. A guitar player, if you didn't right? know that. Yeah. yeah, I played the blues with him and Kev Mo actually, at this uh, Nam thing. Yeah, wow. it was a lot of fun. Okay, you start us off. All right, so we're going to take me out to the ball game? Yeah, and then we'll uh, then I'll sing it in Yiddish, and then we'll hear your uh, Mets song. In the people's key. Let's see. <laughs> out to the ball game, take me out to the crowd, buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks, I don't care if I never come back cause it's root, root, root for the home team, if they don't win it's a shame, for it's one, two, three strikes you're out at the old Oh, I can't forget how to count. Game. <laughs> now, you know, you can do that. We, we heard these people do this on the subway going to a Yankee game one night. Yeah. You could do it one beat off. Have you ever yeah, tried that? Go ahead. Take I... me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never come back because it's root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame for It's one, two, three Strikes you're out in the old ball game That's how I say it. <laughs> That's how it is. the ball game Foylem lomer da game Koif mich de litzlach and cracker jacken Viele kein mal in Fortnite da weg, it's sei mut, mut, mut de Boss spieler. Es passt nicht, als mein Verspiel. Well, it's ein, zwei, drei strikes and ice by the baseball spiel. Well, it's ein, zwei, drei strikes and ice by the baseball spiel. Play ball! Of course, I learned that from uh, Mandy Potemkin. It's on his album, oh, Yiddish Music. Nice. All right, Wayne, give us the uh, the Mets song. All right, so this, it, one of my uh, idols, a person I knew also, one of the great songwriters in jazz, the great Dave Frischberg, wrote a lot of baseball tunes. Actually, if you don't know the song, Play Ball, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever hear. It's a gorgeous song. He wrote some great, he didn't just write comedy, but everyone knows him because he wrote Peel Me a Grape, which is one of the, you know, standards, and a few other great tunes like I'm, I'm Hip and... Uh, My Attorney Bernie. My Attorney, My Attorney Bernie. Bernie, of course. <laughs> so, um, 
So Dave also wrote a song called Dodger Blue after he was living out here, which he hated L.A. And, um, and he, but he did like the Dodgers as a, as a youngster. He's from Minnesota originally, so he just rooted for whatever their triple A team was, you know, before he moved to New York. But um, he wrote this great tune, and it's basically like most of it is a list of players' names who played for the Dodgers, both, you know, both in L.A. and in Brooklyn. And uh, I thought, well, the Mets kind of deserve a tune like that because uh, they don't have that story to history as the Dodgers, but, you know, I thought it'd be fun. So I wrote a song called, as opposed to Dodger Blue, I call it a song with orange and blue because everyone knows you can't rhyme orange, <laughs> right? And that's, uh, Charles Mingus told us that, and he wrote a song called A Song with Orange. So this is a song with orange and blue. And as we all remember, the colors of New York City became orange and blue in 1964, and that's why the Mets were incorporated giant orange and Dodger blue, and that was part of the whole concept. So, enough background. You can't find a rhyme for orange, but it's easy to find one for blue. In this way they work well together, and it's been this way since 1962. It's a song with orange and blue I've been singing it all my life through Neath the roar of the Jets We will chant, let's go Mets You gotta believe that it's true On the meadow is where they all play Tom Terrific was never afraid And I swear it's no lie Tommy Agee could fly memories will never fade. Choo Choo and Charlie, Valentine Darling, the Hammer, the Doc, and the Straw. Casey and Willie, Yogi Mazzilli, Shamsky sat out days of all. Was that good, Mark? <laughs> ah, the ball skipped by Mookie, and then under Bill Buckner's glove in the tenth. In the glow of Shay's lights, unforgettable sights, like Tug sprinting in from the pen. NL Sid, Rusty the Kid, Cranepool, Falcone, and Swan, Kuzmin to Grody, Piazza to Coney, Buddy and Cleon and Don. It was Lindsay and Murph with a call. JC's polish was found on the ball. When the Cubs saw the cat, they forgot how to bat. Jesse's glove, why it never did fall. So let's drink up the orange, we won't be blue through and through. We'll raise up a cheer and sip Rhine Gold beer with a toast to all Met fans to orange and blue. I'm particularly proud of that line, um, Crane Pool. Falcone and Swan. That's <laughs> my bird line. <laughs> the Mazzilli rhyme was good too. Thanks. So, Wayne, who who on the who was referred to as the hammer on the Mets? Mel, uh, John, John, uh, Milner. Uh, John Milner. John Milner. John Milner. What who? You got Charles and Milner. Too. Milner? Yeah. yeah. Was... Never even heard of him. But speaking of, base for a while. But speaking yeah. of the hammer. We're in Yankee land back then. You wouldn't know. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> the speaking of the hammer, it's a perfect segue. Chula Meat has a story about Hank Aaron, Hammer and Hank. But now you're eating. I caught you in the middle of a bite. It's okay, I swallowed. <laughs> so the year was, I believe, 1970, maybe 71. And I was uh, one of the top Tupperware managers in the country. And we were at a seminar. And the name of the distributorship I worked for was Cadetco Sales. 
Well, that's sort of an important part because we used to dress in like ridiculous uniforms, but this particular one involved white go-go be- uh, boots and white hot pants and a red, white, and blue shirt. So the session ended and I went to get on the elevator of this very, very large, fancy hotel. And when I got on, I saw at the back, there were some guys standing there. And one of them smiled at me and I smiled back and he said, do you know who I am? And I said, well, I think you're Hank Aaron. He said, well, that's exactly who I am. Would you like to have a drink with me? And I I said, well, that would be really nice. I could meet you in the lobby in about 20 minutes. And he said, no, no, I'm in the penthouse suite. You need to come to my room. And I I declined, (laughs) I must say. I know he could have been my daddy, my baby daddy or something like that, but I decided... It wasn't such a good idea. So that was my my encounter. (laughs) (laughs) Great story. Wow. (laughs) That's my sound effects machine, yeah. (laughs) So I think this is the perfect time for our baseball, Jewish baseball trivia quiz. If you think you know the answer, I think every, uh, unmute yourself and just, you know, Everybody unmute yourself who wants to participate. Wayne and Lisa have not seen these, although they might have a little bit of a head start on you. Um, But um, here we go. Here I'm going to share with you. The first question is, let me spotlight myself. Who are the two Jewish pitchers who most recently started against each other for their respective teams? Max Fried and someone. Yes, Max Fried and someone. Who was that someone? Dandy Koufax? (laughs) No, No. most recently. Somebody somebody named Kramer, right? Ooh, okay. Hold on. Kramer versus Kramer. It was (laughs) Kramer versus Kramer. Uh, Not quite. It was. uh, There they are, Max Fried and Dean Kramer. I didn't know he was Jewish. I didn't know he was Jewish either. Yeah. Well, you see, (laughs) who knew? Yeah, the only Jewish picture I had heard of was Sandy Koufax. Well, let's move on to that because the next question is, who are the two Jewish pictures who started against each other before Max Fried? It's not Max Friend. Max Fried and Dean Kramer. And tell me the year, the extra points for the year. These are tough ones, Mark. Come on, you know one of them. Well, obviously Sandy, Sandy Koufax. Koufax. And who? Chicago Cubs, also, lef- also a lefty. Ferguson Jenkins. <laughs> it was 1978, but I don't Jenkins know. Jenkins was a righty. 67? Ken Holtz. Oh, that's off by you. Good pitcher. Yeah, he was yeah. very good. Didn't he play pay for Oakland for a long time? He did. He yeah. Yeah, they won several series with Oakland, I think. Okay. I think it, they get easier. Well, some of them do. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh so here is... Uh, <laughs> This this is Wayne's man cat. Oh, there it is, the picture yeah. behind Lisa um, of signed Sandy Koufax. Look, Phil, I have my Gil Hodges bobblehead <laughs> that we got last year at the uh, at the Mets versus Dodgers. And who's the, you know, I can't remember who's the starting. Who's the is starting? that see, Tom Seaver? Who is this? Tom Seaver. Tom yeah, it's Tom Seaver. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question is, which base Jewish baseball ball player was the first designated hitter to make an official plate appearance in a major league. Baseball game. Ron Bloomberg. Ron, yeah, that's right. Ron Bloomberg is correct. That's right. Elliot, I don't think Elliot Maddox was Jewish. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, he wasn't. But he did wear a Star no, of David, if I'm he remembering did. He correctly. Did. I thought he converted, but I think oh. he was converted. Oh, mind. really? I, okay. I'm not sure. I think so. Okay, next question. Uh, Ron Bloomberg is right. Which Jewish ball player served as a spy for the United States government during oh, World War II? Mo Berg. Mo Berg. Mo Berg is correct. And as a matter of fact, hopefully the next year at the annual Moshe Baseball Night, we'll have, um, why her Aviva? name is, what? Aviva? Aviva Kempner? Aviva Kempner on, because Aviva's a friend and, uh, and she, uh, it's, do you guys, everybody know who Aviva Kempner is? So she did the, the documentary about Mo Berg and also Hank Greenberg. Hank Greenberg, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of other. Is that, is that how you got named your daughter? Or? Mo, 
<laughs> that must have a J. <laughs> Which Jewish owner of a major league baseball team is the only team owner in North America to have won championships in two different major league sports? That's got to be Ryan Storr. Ryan Storr. What team? What team? Suns, right? Did oh, I'm the thinking no. The White Sox for sure. And Chicago Bulls. It was yeah. the Bulls. Oh, okay. okay. Red Barber once said that Babe Ruth and uh, and Jackie Robinson were two of the three most important men in baseball history. Which Jewish figure was the third? And and, and I, apparently I had already clicked on the answer when I took the screenshot. But have you ever heard of Barney Dreyfus, anybody? Heard of Barney Greengrass? I heard of the Dreyfus <laughs> Affair. Barney Rubble. And Barney Rubble. And the Dreyfus Affair. There we go. Um, which of these Jewish ball players did not hit home runs in four consecutive at bats? Art Shamsky, Sean Green, Mike Epstein, or Hank Greenberg? Hank Greenberg. Oh, no, Sean Green. Sean Green. No, Sean Green. Sean Wayne, Green Lisa? Did. I thought Sean Green did. He did. Okay. It was Hank Green. Green. Did. No, I know. I said it's not, it's <laughs> not Hank Green. Green. Sean Green is not the answer. That's Who right. said Hank Greenberg? Jay. That was correct. It's a pitcher, and he's not, you know, the, the, you know, a pitcher. But, 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 he's, he's not a pitcher. Why would I think he was a pitcher? No, 50, no. 50 home run hitter. 54 home yeah. runs? Yeah. He's a Hank Greenberg's the one who really didn't Before go. my time. Who really didn't play on Yom Kippur because yeah. Koufax right. stayed at the hotel. Hank Greenberg went to Shul. That's right. And, and, <laughs> and an embarrassing moment of his life, he tells, and I, I, I think it's in the Hank Greenberg story that when he walked into shul, he was like what six four. People gave, got up and applauded for him. He was so embarrassed. <laughs> All right, next. Which was the first major league baseball stadium with a kosher food concession? Shea, Tiger Stadium, Memorial Stadium, Baltimore, Ebbets Field. Got to either be Shea or Ebbets. Ebbets. No, not one of you have said that. Shea. No. Shay. No. no. Tiger. No. Memorial, Memorial Stadium. Ball. Memorial. Oh, I said Memorial. Really? Oh, you said Memorial Stadium? Yeah. yeah, I did. Yeah. So, because I, I remember when they opened the, the, the yeah, one. It's the movie Avalon. It's got it. In what, what way? Yeah. They, they opened one in Camden Yards. And I remember... Right talking to the guy and he said oh yeah we used to have one at, at memorial too right and and when i w found my way to the one at camden yards which was like in the nosebleed section i think if mm -hmm. i remember correctly they they have they 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 chant they do mincha and a after the fifth inning of uh, night games and sometimes mincha mara if it's late if it's late enough <laughs> but i don't know if they still do that um oh so this leads me to my story you see what it says yeah it says mark this really was my shirt mickey mantle so I think some of you have heard the story, uh, but I'll tell it again. I don't think you guys, uh, Wayne and Lisa, have heard this. So my father was a dress manufacturer, and um, he only sold wholesale except for on, on Shabbos. My father went to work on Shabbos. In other words, the, the business owned him. He didn't own the business. And on Shabbos, he was open for real retail. Well, it was wholesale. Really. Anybody could come in and buy a dress. So one day, in walks... The wife of Whitey Ford, Yogi Berra, and the equipment manager, whose name was, why is his name going out of my head? Because he's the most important name in the story. I'll come back to it. He's named in, what's her name? It's a book on on, uh, on the Mick. Who wrote that, Lisa? Um, a Jewish writer. Do you remember? Anybody? Oh, um, you know her. I know her. Um, yeah. If you think of it, just butt in here. Jane something? Jane, Jane Gross. Oh, yeah, that's Jane. it. Jane, yeah. Jane Gross? Jane Gross or Jane Heller? Jane, 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 Jane. Okay, Jane Hell, somebody right? Google it. Jane Heller was the friend that we knew, the right. person we knew. I thought it was Didn't Jane Didn't she write a book about that? I, I thought she did. You no, know, she might have. I, was, I don't know why I was thinking Jane Gross. But in any case, my Jane's. Father. There are so many Jane's women sports writers, I can't just <laughs> <laughs> take it all funny. straight. So my father finds out that they not only were there, but they bought dresses and they were going to need to come back to be for fitting, right? And then uh, for a final fitting. And when he found out, he told the people up front that when they come in, I wanna talk to them. And so what happened was they came back and, darn it, I can't remember his name. 
Um, the equipment manager's wife. He, my father says, he, my, fa- my son's like a big, big Yankee fan, a big, big Mickey Mantle fan. And so the wife puts us in touch with the husband, who lives across the street from the Yankee Stadium, right off of the Grand Concourse, who gives me, who, who invites me and my dad to come to Yankee Stadium to meet Mickey Mantle and the rest of the team after batting practice. And so we are standing right in front of the clubhouse and we can look up the ramp and I can see the sky because you can from the ramp through the through the sky. You're looking through the dugout. Right. And here come the players. Right. Coming after batting practice, fielding practice and um, and down. And and he's introducing us to all the players. And of course, here comes the Mick and he shakes my hand. And I was in like seventh heaven. In any case, this guy's name was Tom something. I'm going to remember it to F right after we sign off. Anyway, he gets us the shirt. It's an undershirt. It's not a obviously a game worn shirt, but they used to wear these woolen shirts underneath their um, uh, their their uh, you know their their yeah their their their, 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 their game shirts. And um, I don't know how they did that, but you see it says Mick Seven, and on the back it says Mantle Seven. Um, and that year, I went to this guy's apartment because he invited me anytime I wanted to come and pick up passes, I could come and do that. And I must have gone to 15 Yankee games that year, and, and I could take a friend with me. We'd sit in the press box, and I saw Mantle go five for five with hitting home runs from both sides of the plate in the same game one time. It was unbelievable. So I've got this shirt. I put it away. Of course, you see the moth holes in it. I didn't take great care of it as I got older, but it was sitting away somewhere. Years later, the whole, you know, souvenir collectible stuff is uh, getting hot. And so I wonder how much this thing is worth. So I take it to a, you know, a collector, you know, one of these stores and the guy says, well, it's not worth anything unless you have it, you know, uh, not syndicated, uh, not vindicated, not syndicated, uh, validated. validated, validated, What's it called? Validated. Validated. Yeah. Validated. Yeah. yeah. Let's this there's some way of, 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 of securing, you know, that this was, this is a real deal. Authenticated. Authenticated. Thank, Thank you. Authenticated. You win. And so I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Well, my parents were living in Lauder Hill, Florida, and the Yankees were still in Fort Lauderdale. I send them the shirt. My father and my mother go to a spring training game in those days, you know, it was like nothing. You, know, you can go and sit and, you know, and the players, are, the mantle was there with Whitey Ford. They're sitting in the stands, you know, watching the game. It's not like it is now. And they take the shirt with them. And my, and my father's sitting with the shirt. My mother says, my father says, I, that's mantle sitting over there. My mother says, no, Adolf, go, go. Right. <laughs> it's like to say, go show him the shirt. And sure enough, he goes and shows Mickey Mantle the shirt. And according to my father's story, he said, Mantle says, I remember that shirt. <laughs> and so Mantle signs with an indelible pen on the shirt, Mark, yes, this really was my shirt, Mickey Mantle, April 8th, 1987. Um, which sounds a little late, late for spring, for spring training. training. Um, but if they were, um, if, he, if he was involved with the team, it would have been spring training still for the minor league players yeah that's true i don't so know they would have been you know people who are either on the dl or whatever would right. they still be right. there at the at the complex but this is now a mystery because why did they go i'll never know so that's my mickey mantle story um, and now we have a hank aaron story and a mickey mantle story lisa i want to go back to your story um hello no, I'm not pushing the wrong button. Uh, tell us about your childhood and your dad and how you got into sports training. I will. I, I just got to say that the, the funny thing is that my dad is actually not a really big part of this story. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it was the That's why you wrote the story. Yes. Well, it was all about just baseball, period. Right. He was just exactly. Um, so my, my dad was not a big guy, like 5'8", 130, soaking wet. Um, he went to uh, a private school boys school in New York and he you might was have actually, heard of it. It's called Horace Mann. <laughs> well if you're if you're New Yorkers you might yeah. have heard of it otherwise yeah so he went to Horace Mann. Um he was actually his main well, sport was swimming. He was a really good swimmer well, but he played baseball. The kid with the Yankees who was like great in that last series against the Astros, he went to Horace Mann, right? Pedro, he went. Oh the third baseman? 
he was a what? Who, who for the the Astros? But he, the Yankees. The Yankees. He was like he had this incredible series in the in the ALCS against the Astros. He hit like three home runs or something like that. He went to Harvard. So anyway, they have a good, they're a good sports program yeah. there. I have a lot of friends who went there. Anyway, ba- that's, Bader or something that's, like that. Oh, Harrison Bader. Yeah, Harrison Bader. Okay. Oh, also Jewish, Jewish, right? Right. Also Jewish, yes. Um, so my dad was the star of the, the pit, star pitcher of the baseball team. Um, and when they did, I guess, I don't know what newspaper it was, the American something, it's a paper that doesn't exist anymore, it's a daily paper in New York, and they'd have at the end of each season, you know, the New York area, like Tri-State All-Stars, and MVP, and um, they had a picture, they all got to got them together at Yankee Stadium, and they were all pictured in front of the dugout, and Y.E. Ford, Ed Ford from Aviation High, was one of the runners up. And my dad actually won the MVP, which is crazy because he didn't play he didn't play sports in college. I mean, basically after that was, he graduated high school in '45, he went into the Navy for a couple of months. Obviously, he never had to go overseas. Came back, went to Amherst, and did not play any sports there at all. So that's his baseball story. But he was a big Yankee fan and would take me to games when I was young. I mean, not really kind of say, oh, you have to go and become a baseball fan, but when he took me, I really... Journal American, it. that's right, Phil. Journal American, thank you. <clears throat> um, I have the picture somewhere, it's like, like tattered and old and the original, <laughs> but um, I just became a baseball fan going out to games with him and my mom. My mom enjoyed baseball. She had gone to games as a kid also at Yankee Stadium, so she grew up in the Bronx. And how did you become a sports writer? Well, um... So I worked for uh, Manhattanville College. I don't know if the New Yorkers here, but it's a school in Westchester. We were living in Westchester after we got married, and I got a job working in their public relations department, and then in what they called the Department of Special Programs, where I basically administered a lot of um, adult classes, extra classes for people who wanted to come. We ran a writer's workshop, a writer's workshop, and one of the perks was I, I could, if it didn't conflict with my work hours, participate in any of the classes or workshops I wanted. So I took one in uh, essay writing, I guess. It was, it, was, it was a writing workshop. And we were just supposed to basically just gave us a cue and says, you know, and said, write however many hundred words about something you really love. So I just kind of wrote about being a baseball fan and baseball, and it was very stream of consciousness, I'm sure. But um, afterwards, you know, he had us reading the stuff out loud, and he said, you need to send that to a magazine. That's really good. So, because I know so much about it, I'm like, sure, I sent it to Sports Illustrated, because why wouldn't I? I knew nothing about writing or anything. I had no intention ever of being a reporter. I love baseball. Um, and they, I get a phone call, I don't know where we would do it. Oh, you know, this is Catherine Wolf, or whatever her name was, from Sports Illustrated, and uh, we'd like to buy your I was like, oh, great, okay. She was, yeah, let's well, send fifteen hundred dollars, and I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking maybe I should actually think about pursuing this. <laughs> so I ended up getting a like a part time job um, in a local bureau in Westchester, and I worked there for three years. Not just baseball, I covered everything. I was the wrestling writer of the year two years in a row. That was my favorite. <laughs> um, and after three years there. I just sent out, you know, I was sending out resumes places, but only to places that Wayne would be willing to move. Because he had kind of had it with the band he was with, and he was willing to leave New York, so I could look in the D.C. area, I could look in Florida, and I could look in New Jersey, I think we all. Not a whole lot of options. There weren't a certainly lot of not teams major. In New well, I didn't even, you know, I, I didn't even, I'd never seen a minor league game. Literally, never been to a minor league game. But I got called for an interview at a local paper in Virginia. That covered, that covered really, really big, probably one of the, um, the Prince William Cannons. So they were a Class A team, the Yankees. And I got the job, and I had literally a week <laughs> to pack up and move and find a place to live that was near the park. Wayne stayed up in New York for two months. So I was down there for two, the first for April and May. He came down in the middle of June. And I loved it. Oh my God. I had no idea how much I would love just covering the games and writing under deadline every night. This was before the internet. 
So it was wonderful. You know, you didn't have to worry that everybody else was going to have the same story and beat you on something. Wrote the story, by 11 o'clock hit send, we all went out and smoked in the parking lot. I mean, so, <laughs> that was, you know, it was, it was three plus years there that were fantastic and wonderful and a lot of great people. And then I got, I don't want to say poached, but sort of poached by um, Baseball Weekly, which was a brand new offshoot of USA Today and also a half hour from where we lived, so it was in the same area. There had been, um, their minor league writer would come to the Cannons games and he said, oh yeah, I know, I, I know who you are because I've seen your name on the men's room walls. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that they would, the, 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 the team would post my game stories from the night before and take them over the urinals. Guys busy with something. To and do. how would you know? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I knew because Bill told me. And so he's like, I really, really think you should apply to come work here. I think you'd be a great fit. Um, so I got the job there. For the first two years, I was just doing a little bit of everything. And then in 94, during the strike, they completely reorganized and Bill became a senior writer and I became the minor league editor of the paper. Mm. And I stayed there in that job till 2005. And what about being a woman sports writer? Did you ever run into, or was the door already, already open? Well, the, I will not say that the door's already open. I was actually one of the very early ones. I think at the time I was certainly the only woman baseball minor league beat writer in the country as far as I know. Um, it, it, there weren't a lot. But the thing about the three years that I was at Prince William, um, the clubhouse was closed to everybody. And I believe the reason for this was that my predecessor had made so many enemies that they couldn't just keep her out. And she had been, mm -hmm. I was preceded by a woman. But they just said, okay, we're not allowing any reporters in the clubhouse just so that they couldn't say, well, Chris, you can't go in, but the other guys can't, because that would not have been a cool thing. Mm -hmm. But you can meet with the, uh, but the fact is, I'd get there two, three hours before the game, and I'd sit in the dugout, and all the players would come out and talk to me, and I'd catch them after the game, I'd jump the fence and get whoever the person was that was the star of the game. And um, I never, yeah, clubhouses, they're dingy and smelly. I mean, it's so much nicer just do it in the dugout or on the field. Yeah. So I really never had a problem, and I very, very rarely got any, I mean, all the issues, even when I did some major league stuff, I, ne I never got hassled. Once. Yeah. Once. And that, even that wasn't really <clears throat> hassling, was just being a jerk. But, but another player stuck up for me. That's right. At right th at, so <laughs> I had a pretty good run. Excellent, excellent. So I'm keeping my eye on the time. We're uh, coming in for a landing. Uh, there's two things I want to make sure we cover. First is the fact that I remembered the name of the equipment manager. His name was Pete Sheehy. Oh, oh Clubhouse yes. Pete. Clubhouse Pete. Is Clubhouse right. Pete. Yes. He was the one whose apartment I went to uh, right across the Grand Concourse to get tickets. He was. That makes sense. Um, and. Uh, before we end, I want to hear some of your stories from Japan, Wayne. I have some oh, yeah. up here ready to go. Here's one of them. Uh, what are we looking at here, Wayne? All right. Um, it's not in the main thing for me right now. Okay, so. I'll put. I'll spotlight it. Yeah, spotlight. There you go. Okay, so that's... Um, I, I don't know if you guys um, ever heard the term human rain delay, but that was a reference to a guy named Mike Hargrove, who was the world's slowest working pitcher. Now, thank God they have a pitch clock. It's such a great thing. Well, there's a guy who pitches for Chiba Latte who is worse than Mike Hargrove. I mean, it was easily 90 seconds between pitches, maybe even two minutes sometimes. That's the guy pitching right now. But I went to see um, this team, the Orcs Buffaloes, hosting the Chiba Latte Marines. And this was in Osaka. And this was a week and a half ago. And yeah. it was amazing. It was, you know, one of the, the wildest things I've ever seen because I don't know if any of you have ever seen videos or have, Jay, I guess you've been there, right? Yeah. And, and basically what happens is that they have two huge sections in the outfield, one for the home team uh, <laughs> cheering squad and the other for the visiting team cheering squad. And they, when their team is at the plate, they basically play songs and stomp and yell and applaud 
And everyone knows the songs in the in the stadium. If the home team fans, you know, will know this thing along, and it's it goes on for the whole inning. I mean, regardless of what's happening. But one thing that was weird was that they don't make a sound until the first pitch, and then as soon as that first pitch is thrown, it goes crazy, and it's the one of the loudest things you'll ever hear. It's like being at a rock concert. It's that loud. <laughs> well, that and, particular. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That particular stadium, the Kyocera Osaka Dome, is really important because it was Kyocera and the founder Inamori who created the, who was a graduate of Kagoshima University and started an entrepreneurship program there. And that was a program I ended up teaching for the first time there for oh, wow. five years. And, and my former wife is from there. And so I spent a lot of time in, in Tokyo and in Kyoto and Osaka working with Kyocera. Oh, that's great! And went to a, a you know a bunch of games though in oh, sure. uh, in Tokyo Dome, which is just crazy. Yeah, that's um that uh, is one of the vendors, and I was just you know I'm looking at this you know young, lovely woman selling beer, and I was thinking this is not something you would not see at Shea Stadium. <laughs> so what 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 do the we... vendors look like at Shea Stadium? <laughs> <laughs> what were the different kind of food offerings that would be a little different? Uh, they, had, they have some crazy food there. I mean, there's no question about it. But the, the thing that cracked me up the most was a hamburger. You know, they have like a hamburger company called Most Burger, M-O-S Burger. And it's, you know, I guess, you know, their local version of, of one of our fast food burger chains. And they have teriyaki burgers and what you would expect. Mm -hmm. But one of them has like a scrambled egg and noodles. Between the, between the burger and the bun. This is one of the weirdest looking things I've ever seen. There's a big picture of it, so I took a picture of that. That should be one of them. Yeah, I think has, there's a lot of cup noodles sold. Yeah, that, of course, everywhere, yeah. And, um, oh, and wait, is, what's going on here? Tug of this War? This is a pre-game tug of war between fans from the two teams. They love tugs of war for some reason. They're a tug of war <laughs> in Japan. It's a big deal. So that was that was like all right. That's not your typical pregame ceremony in the, in the United States. That's for sure. <laughs> it was the, they were into it too. That's great. So I had a great time at at, at the ballpark. It was you know one of those things I've always wanted to do go to a Japanese ball ball game. They they take the game seriously, but I got to tell you, Mark, I was very surprised and actually chagrined that. You know, you always hear that Japanese play baseball the right way, which is, you know, when you say that, that means by the book. Mm -hmm. Move runners over, you bunt when you have to bunt, you know, you play for the for the out always, you know, you don't try and make the special play. And I would say three times in this game, I first guessed the, the, the managers of the team. And they, they did something that I said, well, now you have to do this, and they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And they did something wacky, and, and it cost them every time. I was right every single time. <laughs> hey, I have to tell you, I'm ready to manage over there. Well, hey, maybe you have a future. There are big bucks for some Call people. Coach. So, um, I, I do. Valentine want to... was there for a while, coaching, managing. Bobby Valentine was yeah. there for a long time. Yeah, which proves they'll take anybody, Wayne. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Bobby, so, I want to share a teaching from the Talmud and then a little Kabbalah before we we um, uh, we bid adieu tonight. First of all, um, there is a teaching. Chayav Adam levarech et hara k'shem shehu mevarech al hatova. What this means is that a, a person is obligated to to bless the 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 ra, the bad things that happen, just as a person blesses good things that happen. Okay, because everything you know, obviously everything comes from divinity, and that's the reason the rabbis say that. So my question here, Wayne and Lisa, if you had a really knowledgeable Jewish ball player, wouldn't that Jewish ball player, you know, the way all the the, the, the Christian ball players, you know, they point out they home run, they hit a home run, they hit the plate, and then they look up to the sky, right? Wouldn't the Jewish ball player do it for that? And when he struck out. If, if both the good and the bad, wouldn't you point up or point wherever God exists? You know, that just makes sense to me in a very weird kind of way. Okay, the other thing I want to touch on, I'm going to share my screen, is a little Kabbalah from our friend Ruven um, Goldfarb. Um, uh, let me see, Shulamit already already left, but she knows Ruvain. Ruvain lives in Israel, but he's uh, he was a very, very dedicated follower of Reb Zalman. 
And uh, I think you'll like this. Well, I hope you do it anyway. Let me spotlight myself. You can see this. Oh, I am spotlighted if you want. Okay. So Ruvain says that God might have said, play ball instead of let there be light. And you've heard of the seventh inning stretch. Does that sound like Shabbat to you? Well, in any case, the tree of life with its 10 spherot may be superimposed upon the players in the field, meaning all of the defensive players plus the batter, poised to begin their game. And this is the correspondence in the way I see it. So he, he gives a, he relates a uh, sphera to each of the um, players on the field, including the batter. So Keter, the crown of creation, there's a reason why the Grateful Dead called their album that, uh, corresponds to center field. And we can go through all of these sphero, but I don't want to do that right now because it's just too lengthy. Uh, to do that. But if you're interested in seeing this, I'd be happy to share this with you. I can send it to everybody here who's on the call. But here's what he says. What makes the game or the tree interesting and relevant is the motion that develops when the system is activated. In other words, you know, when when somebody hits the ball, all the, the players start moving. Everybody on the field are moving in different positions, especially if it's like a sacrifice bun, for instance. Uh, it's like a real dance that goes on. The same thing is true with any of the spherot. If, if a different sphera is activated, it activates other spherot like a giant pinball machine so that things are pinging one energy source against the next, uh, causing things to happen that sometimes you uh, unpredictable. It's a dynamic system responding to circumstances, but guided by several underlying principles or rules. Um, in Jewish life, we might call it halacha. We might call it, it's the Tao, it's the way, it's, it's the, the rules of the game, halachot. In the, in the case of baseball, it's the rules of baseball that govern. Well, I love this next paragraph from Ruvain. Whatever the runners and fielders do, a scorekeeper records the results, an action analogous to cheshbon hanefesh, the counting of the soul, by which an ethical Jew periodically assesses his or her behavior. If someone scores a run, he comes home. Ah, if I knew the way, right? Olam Abba, the world to come. And you receive a reward, a positive mark in the scorebook, and a warm welcome from teammates and fans. If he's a great player, he may be admitted to the Hall of Fame, which he likens to Gun Eden, which is paradise. There in the gallery of heroes, his deeds are acclaimed by successive generations and compared with those of other standouts. There is similar hagiographic praise for the accomplishments of great prophets, sages, solid scholars, and rabbis in our sacred literature. Uh, Ruvain goes on and on. It's really quite beautiful. Um, and if you want to see this or just Google, or I could send you the link to, it's a whole article that he has on the Kabbalah of baseball. In both disciplines, the concept of teammate, teamwork is paramount. A player who sacrifices himself for his team, misirat hanefesh, selfish service, even martyrdom, or who leads his team, admor, the leader of his generation, is equally praised. In Jewish terms, this quality is described in pure keavot as not distancing oneself from the community. <laughs> Isn't that nice, right? So you are part of a whole. Um, and in baseball, perhaps in any more so than any other sport, I think that is very true. So with that, um, how about we uh, count the Omer? Uh, yesterday was 34. And uh, I don't have the words here with me. But, um, oh, wait a second, I do want to share this with you. If you can see that, there is a plaque you can get it on Etsy. It's baseball and the Spherot. Right, looking like the tree of life, and you can see from Keter on top, you got the you got three, six, nine, ten players, um, and uh, and each one is corresponding. All righty, what key do I do this in? Kayem et ha mitzvah ta say al 
Asfirat Omer, Asfirat Omer. Sheva Shabato, Timi Motiena, Sheva Shabato. Timi moti ena ay 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 Mel, you just arrived. What were you, you in the trainer's room? Eloheinu melech ha'olam Ha'asher kiddushanu V'mitzvotav v'tzivanu Ha'asfirat ha'omer Ha'asfirat ha'omer Ha'asfirat ha'omer Ha'asfirat ha'omer Today is the 35th day of the counting of the Omer. So I want to thank uh, Wayne and Lisa for joining us this evening. Uh, for, as I always like to say, the people who were in here, as, as Charlie and Dave like to say, you blew it! <laughs> Locked him up. <laughs> and so, that said, here's how what's played the song by Jewish songwriter Steve Goodman at the end of every Cubs win. Uh, what happened there? There we go. Come on. Video unavailable? Don't do that to me. <laughs> Oh, wait, watch it on YouTube, it says. Oh, yeah, it's... It it's not working. Okay, I'll click on here. Okay, maybe I can share. Well, I have to play this. Okay, you have to play Danny Do We Meet the Mets again. Yeah, really. You could do that. I got it, though. He does another song. Baseball season's on. Ah, you hear it? You better get ready for a brand new day. Hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are gonna win today. They're singing, Go Cubs, go! Go Cubs, go! Hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are gonna win
So a number of years ago, I actually went to Wrigley for the first time. It was like going to Mecca. And it was the coldest baseball game. I was literally shivering in my seat. Um, and I'm sorry to say that the Cubs did not win that day because then they didn't because they didn't sing the song. And apparently all the fans break the fans break into that song right after the game, after a win. And I would love to have seen that. Anyway, any last words before we say say Yeah, where can we get see a, a version of the Mets song that Wayne did? Is that up anywhere? It's yeah, it's on YouTube. I I posted actually my daughter did a really nice little um montage. Do you have a link? Uh, yeah, I'll send. Uh, let me see if I can figure out where the heck it is, and I'll send it to you. She does not sing in it. She's no, no, it. no. It's just me. It's just me. Yeah, put the link in. Yeah, let me. She's let me improved a lot since See if I can three. find it here. Yeah. <laughs> I know quite a few people would enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's. She did a great job too with the montage, especially you know with the crane pool thing. She actually had three shots of birds for each one. <laughs> was really after showing all the players. Um, Has anybody here heard my blessing of the baseballs video? Yeah, Judy is in. You know about that, Wayne, Lisa? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So I got a call from a local radio station one day to come down to Nats Park with a, with a, with a pastor, but she never made it, but she is on the video. So me and Renee went down. It was like opening day, and, and Renee juggled while, um, while, we, <laughs> while I did this rap. Uh, or, <laughs> about they wanted us to bless the baseball I, what, what can i tell you did it work that year it was great fun how, how did they do that year uh they did they, they did really well that year but they, okay. they there was maybe nothing you should go there. back <laughs> all i have to say as i leave is go dodger blue uh, uh Wayne, did you put it in the chat yet? I'm, I'm trying. It's taking a second here for to come up. Just send it to me. I can also send it to everybody. I'm trying to, oh, to I, stop it. Post, though, isn't it. Oh, I guess. Yeah, I don't know who posted it. But, well, um, I did. 